Hi, I'm Mike DiGirolamo, a partner and producer with Simpatico Studios, where we live stream conversations about complex business and social challenges with professionals like yourself who are working on the same issues. Our shows are live streamed in front of a global audience on Simpatico.tv. I'm hosting conversations with journalists, filmmakers, authors, entertainers, and other folks in the media on the Impact Media channel. If you're interested in the work that these professionals are doing, you came to the right place. If you work in the media and you'd like to be a guest, please reach out to me. I'm always looking for compelling creators to speak with about the work that they are doing. With that said, I'm glad you're here. Please sit back and enjoy the conversation. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Impact Media. Uh, today, I have a very special guest. His name is Kevin J. Patel, and he is a youth climate and environmental activist and is the founder and executive director of One Up Action, which is an organization that works to fight for a regenerative future by providing resources and support to marginalized youth to take direct action in their own communities to combat the climate crisis. Kevin joins us today to share his story and his lived experience growing up in Los Angeles, which includes him having to live with heart issues brought on from air pollution. And he's gonna share with us how he is leading the charge on giving youth a bridge to influence government and voices to youth leaders in his community and beyond. So excited to have him today. Uh, Kevin, welcome to the show, how you doing? How are you? I'm doing great. Um, it's an early morning, but definitely I'm doing great. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us here. And uh, I know we're getting close to the holiday season and everyone's schedules are getting tighter. So we really do appreciate you taking the time out. So Kevin, I, uh, we're just gonna get right into it. I, I, I'd love for you to go ahead and give us a backstory into, into your lived experience. Um, you grew up in, in what's called the sacrifice zone. Uh, what is that? And can you tell our audience you know, how it was growing up in that environment? Yeah, definitely. I'm going to just make sure that I'm getting the sacrifice zone correctly because, uh, you know, sacrifice zone or sacrifice area is a geographic area that has been permanently uh, impaired by environmental damage or uh, economic, uh, dis uh, you know, disinvestment, uh, which is basically, you know, a community that hasn't been really invested with the resources to combat the issues, the complex issues that it has been brought forth, like environmental damage um, and all these other inequalities and disparities uh, and injustices that are happening to these communities. And I'm living in South Central Los Angeles and all the neighboring communities around South Central Los Angeles are also sacrifice zones and sacrifice areas. And, you know, what that means is that we're not getting the resources to combat the real issues that we are facing such as environmental damage, such as the inequalities and injustices that we're facing. And so, you know, growing up in South LA has been really seeing how, you know, we have a huge homeless population towards, you know, uh, seeing the food disparities where we are literally living in a food desert. Um, and, you know, students don't even know where to get uh, fresh, vegan, organic, non-GMO foods because you would have to travel. so far to get those type of, um, you know, foods. And so it's so, you know, it's so important that we recognize that, you know, all of these things are interconnected. And so definitely living in South Central Los Angeles has been such an eye opener because I've been able to see these connections between the food disparities and how I'm living in a food desert to the homelessness crisis and how they're facing, you know, the climate crisis and they're at the front lines of the climate crisis, but also seeing the inequalities to combat these, uh, you know, injustices and, in, in, you know, basic inequalities that are happening. Um, for example, the homelessness, you know, that the unhoused community members that we have in South Central Los Angeles, they're at the forefront and at the front lines of the climate crisis. They're the ones that are faced with the heat waves or the ones that are, you know, that don't have access to clean air, to clean water because of the air pollution. And so all of those factors come together in this community where the people who are living in this community are being faced with, um, you know, disparities in having clean air, clean water, clean food and so on and so forth. And so that's basically what I've had to go through living in a South Central, you know, South Central Los Angeles, um, while also being affected personally by the air pollution that Los Angeles is ravaged with. 
And um, I, I want to make sure our listeners get a picture of that. So you were you were diagnosed with a heart condition at the age of twelve, mm -hmm. um, which is a rather a rather serious occurrence. Can you tell us about that? Um, and what was that like? And and you know, in his uh, in his in any way you can share, how, how did that how did that happen? And and how did you come to draw that it came from the, the air pollution that you had lived through? Yeah, definitely. I guess, you know, when I was at the age of 12, you know, no, no 12 year old should go through this. Um, having their life change in a matter of minutes, you know, going from one second, um, being a healthy, uh, you know, healthy boy who's playing and, you know, a very active person to then going in and out of the hospital the next second. And that's basically what happened to me is, you know, this first semester of my sixth grade year when I was really teaching students about the food inequalities. My whole work started with food inequalities and teaching uh, students how we live in a food desert and how to really, you know, overcome that and bring solutions to the table and making sure that people know, you know, my fellow peers knew uh, that food actually comes from a garden. You can grow your own food. And so that's basically where I started. But second semester of my sixth grade year, that's when I was affected by heart palpitations and, um, you know, uh, at first, you know, I was wondering, you know, how can this happen to me? Where, where is this stemming from? Um, you know, over 40 cardiologists, to my surprise, you know, um, didn't even know where, you know, this problem stemmed, for, stemmed from. I was rushed to the emergency room from my, you know, my middle school. So I was in my middle school sitting in class and then right next second, you know, I'm being rushed in an ambulance to the hospital um, where, you know, cardiologists didn't even know what was going on with my heart. And my heart was racing to 200 to 300 beats per minute. Um, so realizing that, you know, just being in that moment where even the doctors didn't know where this is stemming from and they were scared. And, um, you know, I came to find out that, you know, I had they diagnosed with me irregular heartbeat and heart palpitations and it was stemming, you know, I did my own research, I, you know, me as the person that if I'm not getting it from experts who've been in this field and who are studying hearts for so long, I'll do the research myself. And I came to find out that air pollution and smog pollution are a huge cause of the heart palpitations and irregular heartbeat. But not only that, uh, other, you know, underlying health issues such as asthma, um, and you know cancer as well and so it's definitely something that i kind of have took into consideration it's like it's not just me who is being affected in my community it's being it's the you know my community members the people i love the people i've grown up with that are also being affected and no one's doing nothing about it and so definitely that's how i came to find out is by doing the research myself and um you know los angeles is ravaged by air and smog pollution and so a lot of residents are getting asthma or getting underlying health issues um, like me with heart palpitations and irregular heartbeat. And so, Ed, you know, obviously you, you are, you're now the, you're the founder of, the, of one up action, but there was a, you know, there was a bit of a period that um, in which you decided to go ahead and found this. Um, can you talk a bit about that journey of, of experiencing this um, smog pollution, being diagnosed with a, with a heart condition, to um, taking action in your community, and and why and why um, specifically did you start One Up Action? Um, can you talk? And you, can you talk about the um, that kind of journey that you went through there? Yeah, definitely. You know, as a young person, uh, you know, nine years ago, it's almost a decade since I've been fighting for not only my community but across this nation and fighting for communities that are not able to fight for themselves, right? Um, you know, the, the climate crisis is a global issue and not just a climate crisis, all these other issues are interconnected with it. Uh, and they're caused by the same systems that are perpetrating, you know, racial inequalities, all these other inequalities and injustices are happening to communities, especially, especially BIPOC communities, black indigenous people of color. My whole journey, you know, nine years ago, I saw that, you know, going into space, you know, being a person of color, going into a space that is mainly fight, fighting for environmental rights and uh, environment and justice, a lot of these, you know, spaces were pretty white led and pretty white dominated. Um, and they weren't fighting for communities who are being the most affected by the climate crisis. They were fighting for national parks or conservation and uh, stuff like that, that didn't really 
um, you know, impact community, you know, it didn't really do anything for the communities that are being impacted the most by the climate crisis. And I saw that as a problem because I didn't see people who look like me within these spaces. And, you know, this is nine years ago, keep in mind, uh, now it really has changed, uh, you know, throughout the years, but nine years ago, you know, I came into these spaces where, you know, these big green organizations I was trying to work with to make sure that we can solve the issue of air pollution and smog pollution within Los Angeles. A lot of them were not doing anything about it. A lot of them said that they will support, you know, get some resources, but it was just kind of uncomfortable space being in a, you know, space where I don't have no one that looks like me. And I really wanted to have more people, more young people, especially to who look like me that are in these spaces of, you know, where environmental policy really is being made and uh, where environmental uh, justice is being fought for. And so I really thought if there isn't a space for me, you know, we should start creating spaces. Um, at that time I was very, very young. And so I wasn't really able to do anything besides in my local community and my you know, school community as well by starting the first environmental club in my school um, and stuff like that. But as, you know, fast forward to uh, this day and age, you know, 2019 uh, in September, um, ironically, was the first ever UN Youth Action Summit um, where Greta Thunberg and, you know, two years ago, there was no youth climate movement, but uh, now there is, you know, and th we still have a, a huge problem with, uh, you know, representation and who is really at the decision making tables. And that really is, you know, a lot of people who are from the global north who are, you um, you know, either white or white passing who are uh, really at the key, these key decision tables instead of the global south and, um, you know, BIPOC uh, representation, which is black indigenous people of color, who are not really being represented within these spaces. Um, and I really wanted to do something about it. Uh, but not only that, so it's not only about representation, it's also about resources and where, who gets these resources to really combat the climate crisis. And that's not these communities are at the front lines and at the for, uh, forefront of the climate crisis. And so I definitely know nine years ago, I didn't have the resources. I had no mentor, I didn't have nothing to get started, no toolkit, no guidebook, nothing to really help me to start taking climate action. And I really wanted to do something about that. So that not only is there representation within the climate movement, but there's also resources for marginalized communities, low income communities, BIPOC representation, you know, BIPOC leaders who can get these resources and also be represented and have their voices heard and be at these decision making tables. And so let's, let's highlight, let's talk about some of that. Uh, what was the, yeah, I wanna talk about um, the Youth Climate Commission in, in Los Angeles County that, that you started, but also, you know, what were some of the, the first like successful iterations of, of that, of those uh, chapters that you started where you gave people resources? Um, you know, can you talk about those? Yeah, definitely. I guess I'll start with the Youth Climate Commission because this is one of the things I'm always asked about. It's the first ever in the world and the first ever in the nation. It's never been done before. It's actually a model that I kind of uh, took from uh, Theresa May, who was the uh, former prime minister of, uh, you know, the UK. And, you know, she was creating a council, a Sterling Council, basically for young people. It was something similar to taking action on the climate, but very much bringing all these other issues and I saw that young people, you know, we as young people are so politically engaged. We really just want to, you know, the way that we are really getting engaged is by protesting, doing systematic action, civil disobedience and all of that. But we really want to, we're not taking a step further and really, we're not really being represented within politics. A lot of our views and a lot of the things that we need, you know, to survive for the future are not really being represented right now. And that's the reason why young people are fighting, going on to the streets and saying enough is enough. We really need to start acting acting not only on the climate crisis, but the gun violence, uh, you know, crisis that's happening, the racial inequalities that are happening, you know, and um, acting on all these, you know, issues and making sure that we act on them. Um, and so, you know, two years ago, it was quite an idea of like, you know, I see that young people are coming out to these strikes, the civil disobedience, systematic actions, but they're not really being represented within their own cities. Where, they don't, where they're not able to take these type of actions within their own cities. And I'm just, this is outrageous. You know, we're a nation, you know, we're one of the richest nations, wealthiest nations in, in the country. And if we're not having representation for every single person, including the young people, right? Young people are not, 
I think one of the notions of like young people being the leaders of tomorrow, that's quite wrong. We're the leaders of today. We're making, we're the change makers of today. We're really making strides uh, that older generations are not able to. And so definitely when people tell me that, you know, we're the leaders of tomorrow, I, I say, no, we're the leaders of today. We're acting on that. And we see that throughout this nation. And with that being said, the Youth Climate Commission kind of came about that. It's like, you know, seeing that young people are not getting a voice within their cities, seeing that we're, we as young people are not really getting a voice within politics and not having, you know, a seat at those key decision-making tables. I wanted to do something about it. And so I gathered some friends um, and me and my good friend, Delaney Michelson, who is another climate activist from Los Angeles, uh, put forth a motion at the, one of the you know largest local governments in the nation, which is the Board of Supervisors here in LA County, and got to pass the Youth Climate Commission, and it became the first ever in the world and first ever in the nation. It's never been done before. And hopefully, we're going to get a second one running in New Jersey, but that is to be foreseen in January. Hopefully, they vote yes on it. <laughs> And, you know, I mean, obviously, it, you, when you put the motion forward, it was successful and it, and it got created. Uh, but I'm curious to know, and I'm sure some other people are curious to know, how was it like, how was it like received when you when you first put it on the table? Oh, um, it was well welcomed. It was definitely there was no question about it. There was no doubt about it. You know, I think one of the p things is politicians are starting to recognize that if they don't start falling, you know, for the, the demands of the young people, right, don't start recognizing and hearing the voices of young people who are literally being impacted by these issues and are going to be impacted by these issues, then they're going to lose their, you know, uh, positions in power. And so they're really, uh, you know, when I introduced it, it was quite welcomed because it was never done before. And I think it was a moment to, you know, a moment for the rest of the country, for the rest of the nation, while we were in an administration that rolled back a hundred environmental regulations and policy uh, and protections uh, for clean air, clean water, and um, clean food even. And not only that, we also backtracked on the Paris Climate Accord. And so this was a, this were, this is, this is Los Angeles's or even young people's response to saying enough is enough. We really need to say, you know, we're not, if we're only being at, you know, fighting via systematic action, we're never going to get anything done. We really need to be in these processes be in these key decision, you know, key decision making tables, and be there and start really acting upon these uh, these issues that are impacting us. And so, like I said, you know, it was welcomed with you know a lot of respect and a lot of um, you know admi admi admiration because it's never been done before. And so we wanted to make history, and we did it. Uh, okay. That's amazing. And I think it's important for other people to recognize who may be watching this that, you know, some people who may be afraid that it might be that it might receive opposition. We have, you know, proof here that it, it, it can and will be um, in many cases accepted with open arms, um, hopefully. And, and, and it, de it definitely was in this case here in Los Angeles County. And so I think that that's important to highlight. Um, for other folks that might be thinking of, of starting a similar um, commission in, in their city. Um, I'm curious, do you have any um, specific uh, resources for people who want to start a youth climate commission in their municipality? Um, do you, and, and what kind of training do you provide for people to, to get there? Yeah, definitely. So one of action actually took it upon themselves. I'm sorry. I think. Don't worry. It's totally okay. Uh, um, but you know, One Up Action actually provides, um, you know, these resources for young people to really take. And it's been, you know, it's been amazing because we've seen a lot of responses from, you know, just releasing this as one of our programs to basically help young people to give them the resources and the training. So we give them step-by-step -step trainings for young people across not only this nation, but across uh, the world. And throughout the globe to basically create a youth climate commission so that they are, you know, they have a voice and they're able to make these key decision making tables. So we offer toolkits, guidebooks, and we also just, uh, we assign like a, a mentor for these young people to uh, step by step, you know, making sure that they're getting help to start these uh, commissions within their, you know, prospective countries, prospective states, and sp prospective cities as well. And we and and can you provide any uh, specific examples that where where a similar effort has been duplicated or repeated in, in another city, uh, kind well, of like the Youth Climate Commission? Yeah, definitely. So the Youth Climate Commission right now, you know, we only have, it's only been, you know, 
it's been one year since we've gotten it passed. And so we've been really developing the program at, uh, at One Up Action to really uh, deploy even more youth farming commissions. Let LA be an example, but let other you know communities and uh, countries to be, you also lead that example, you know, follow the example of you know, these communities that are being affected the most by the climate crisis. So, uh, you know, within you know this nation new jersey is you know uh, some young people are starting a youth climate commission there and it's actually going to go forward into voting in january so hopefully you know i, I mentioned that earlier but that might be the second youth climate commission that's ever created uh, so we'll have one on the uh, west coast and then we'll have one on the east coast hopefully um so you know this is the type of efforts that are happening you know these things do take a lot a lot of you know effort to make sure that we're bringing it at the table and saying hey we would want to create this government's take into consideration um it's quite hard to pass but it definitely we can get it done and um i guess los angeles can be a case study in saying that this can be done you know mm -hmm. los angeles you know even the board of supervisors uh la county in general is you know Again, it's one of the largest uh, local governments in, through, you know, in the nation, and uh, we can really see a difference of if one of the largest local governments can make this policy or motion, you know, get passed, then other communities can get this passed as well with no hassle. And so, um, we'll, hopefully, we'll get it passed in, um, you know, at, in New Jersey. Um, but I know I, I wanted to come back to the chapters because I kind of didn't touch on that. Right, yeah, go ahead. I would love to hear more about right. it. Yeah, definitely. So we're in, you know, One Up Action uh, is in 32 countries and we have over 65 or 100 chapters. I'm do blank on that, but within those 32 countries, we do have over 100 chapters, um, you know, various chapters throughout, um, throughout this nation and throughout other communities and other countries. And our major chapter population is in uh, you know, Africa, many African countries do have chapters. And it's just been astonishing to see not only uh, African countries, but European countries, India, um, Asia, and Australia, New Zealand, uh, even South America, we have Peru, Mexico City, uh, Canada. Uh, and so we're definitely growing our bases throughout the United States still. But we we kind of went international pretty quickly just during this year, during the global pandemic, where we kind of bring a group of young people internationally together and saying, you know, let's start, instead of talking about solutions, instead of talking about the climate crisis, let's not only do that, but let's start acting upon it, right? Let's start taking it into our own hands and saying, you know what, we're tired and sick of politicians not acting. I think this is time to step up our actions instead of just doing systematic action. And that's exactly what we did. And, you know, Ever since that, you know, uh, ever since February, we've been able to plant over 5,000 trees. Um, we may, we may successfully, you know, implemented uh, 50 day, you know, the 50th anniversary uh, Earth Day campaign that we did, participated in multiple uh, actions and events that are really actionable steps. Uh, got, you know, got started on making uh, and working with go government officials to start youth climate commissions and also just making sure that young people uh, throughout this nation and throughout the world can get resources to combat the climate crisis, you know, whether that be individually or, you know, we are systematically and our you know, community wide, right? It, action looks like anything you can just, anyone can do it. You know, it just takes one step to really make a difference. And so that's our whole model is making sure that you can take that one step so you can make it that difference. That's an amazing accomplishment, especially during uh, this, this global pandemic. Um, I wanna make sure that uh, the people watching uh, have some information about how they can get in touch with you, either if they wanna get involved with a local chapter or perhaps if they wanna be like a funding partner or someone to collaborate with you. Um, if someone wants to join a chapter, where, where should they go? They should definitely go to oneupaction.org uh, or you know, dot .com, uh, action.org, sorry. Um, and they should definitely check out our chap action chapters page and uh, apply through there uh, or reach out to Bailey at oneofaction.org who is our chapter relations director. Uh, she definitely will handle all of the incoming people. And you can also email me at kevin at oneofaction.org um, and I'll be happy to, you know, to get you involved through our chapter system. But if you want to be a funding partner or a partner in general, you can reach out to me at kevin at oneofaction.org and I'll be happy to definitely, um, you know, get that going. 
Well, thank you for sharing that. And, and, and uh, we're getting towards the end here, but before we, you know, close out the interview, uh, uh, is there anything else that you're working on right now um, that that you want to share with us? Uh, anything in the pipeline that's that's working that that people should know about? Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, One Up Action is about to release uh, in next year. Hopefully, it's uh, the Youth Innovators Fund, and, and that basically is working. You know, young people throughout this nation. Oh, it's going to be a domestic program really working towards making sure that marginalized young people, BIPOC leaders, uh, get the resources and funding so that they can explore nature-based solutions and help them, you know, anyone who has a solution to these complex issues like climate change and all of them, you know, all the umbrella topic of climate change, you know, there's so many topics, extinction, conservation, and stuff like so on and so forth. Um, but if they have nature-based solutions to, you know, apply through our Youth Innovator Sun, our YIP program, which will be funding and giving resources to them. So we'll be relaunching that soon, but uh, it's definitely been hush hush because we've been planning that and we're hopefully going to be releasing that very, very soon. Good. Well, I, I hope we can talk about it here. So, uh, but uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Kevin, it's been a really, uh, a, a real divine privilege having you on here to talk about this. And uh, we're just so glad that you decided to speak with us today. Um, do you have a moment for just a couple of live questions? Uh, yeah, definitely. Great. Okay. So yeah, it, it's just, you just stay on the call. We're going to actually transition out of the episode. Um, and then we'll actually be right back and we'll, we'll, uh, field a couple of live questions. So just go ahead and uh, sit tight. 